John Stevenson. Welcome to Vision for Change Radio with John Stevenson. When faith meets information, everything is possible. It takes just one moment to put your life on the road to success and personal fulfillment. Well, good evening, family. I hope you guys are here logging on. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, I'm not that guy. If you're watching right now, you're going to watch the restream. You know, you, you see people come live and they'll go, all right, let's wait for so-and-so to come. Let's wait for so-and-so to come. You're here or you're not here, but I'm glad you're here. So, uh, of course, you guys know my name is John Stevenson, and I am so glad to be here with you tonight. Thank you all for logging on. Um, listen, do me a favor. Hit that share button. Hit the share button. You definitely want to share this out tonight. Uh, we've got some uh, wonderful things we'll be, we'll be talking about tonight. Now, in my life, I've come across uh, great people. I know a lot of people, wonderful people. But when I came across this man of God, man, some odd, I don't know how many years ago, Pastor Mike, it was, it was years and years ago, I, I, I was at uh, World Changers and man, he, he stood up in that pulpit and it was just something that resonated with my heart. And so every time I went back, I went to the bookstore, I'm loading up on those little white cassettes. Y'all remember cassettes? I, I know, I, <laughs> so <laughs> cassettes of uh, this man of God. So tonight we've got a man of wisdom, a man of faith a man of love, a servant leader uh, that's going to share with us tonight. I welcome to a conversation at the wall, my friend, Pastor Michael T. Smith. Hey, Pastor Mike. Hey, man. Uh, thank you, brother, for having me on. And uh, mm. I, I don't know if everything you said is true. I don't know. I was like, who are they introducing? But uh, I'll take all the good. Uh, there's a, there's enough bad stuff that gets said sometimes. I'll take any of the good I got. So thank you for letting me be part of it. And uh just thank God for the man you are and who you've been over all these years. Um, and uh, it's it's a blessing. I, I, we've talked before uh, and have talked about doing this before. So I'm glad that I'm glad uh, uh, it's an idea whose time has come. Yes, yes, yes. And it's a divine time. So all of you all out there watching. Um, listen, we're going to have listen. We welcome your questions. Uh, Pastor Mike said we're welcome questions. So we'll fuse your questions. If I can catch them on, you know, on Facebook, we'll get your questions in. Uh, if you got any questions about anything we're going to cover now, I, you know, Pastor Mike, I didn't know what the call is. I said, man, you know, it's kind of the wall, but there's so many things in the clip that we 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 yeah. advertised. I had like four or five different things in that, but I said, man, we can call this gumbo, you know. And I know it's if we can get it all in within the time frame, I'm not going to just take up a whole lot of time, everybody. So we say we may do a part two. We'll see how that works out. But uh, tonight, man, we're going to just just kick it, and we're just going to kick it like an organic conversation. Um, now, one of the things that uh, some may know and some may not know about Pastor Mike is that he did a TED Talk. But before we get into that, because that's the hot thing, Pastor Mike, can you just tell everybody who you are? And if Pastor Connie's there, she can scream hello if she wants to, man, because we uh, love her too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, so she's out. I think she's out with my daughter listening outside or whatever it is. So, hey, Con, wherever you are in the house, I know you're somewhere. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a former pastor. I guess I'm still a pastor, maybe a pastor, two different pastors. I stepped down as a lead pastor about five years ago, but I, uh, 2021. So I've been in ministry 30 years. Uh, and, uh, since I started when I was 16 and have youth pastored, senior pastored, uh, associate pastored, uh, everything you take, I've traveled, uh, itinerant ministry, uh, kind of run the gamut. And now I'm kind of in a, a new phase of ministry, really concentrating on doctrinal things. I've got about 14 other pastors that I work with that I serve or advise or cover or whatever role I can play in their lives. Uh, still do conferences, a lot of relationship conferences, things like that. I do consulting for uh, nonprofits and for-profits in the area of uh, could be anything from uh, race and uh, racism issues, relationship issues, um, that kind of stuff. So I'm I'm uh, I'm in a real interesting season of life. I'm, um, personally, I'm married 20 years this year. Coming up in August will be okay. 20 years. Uh, got uh, two kids, a uh, uh, 16 going on 17 daughter and a 13 going on 14 son, a freshman and a senior this year. So that's big time. And uh, that's pretty much my story. So that's uh, I, I hope that hope that gives some sort of introduction to your audience. Yes, yeah, it does, man. You got a lot. And he was, I remember when Olivia and Mike was babies, you know, and now you're talking about she's a senior. 
Jesus, a senior man. uh du dual enrollment senior so she started i'm getting all this college stuff she's a college freshman and a senior this year i'm like how is this how, how when, when i didn't sign off on this but here we go <laughs> good well man i want to start with i want to start off with this uh this ted talk man okay you know it's one thing to hear you preach you know and you know for those of us who know you who are watching and have been uh blessed to be under the ministry you keep preaching we know you're dynamic. I mean, you're one of the preachers that when you sit down, you go, Jesus Christ, you know how you hear certain preachers? That's why I know Jesus was was awesome. Because who stands out there for hours and hear a man just say these thousand and dusts? But he was powerful. Right, right. Man. And you you you're awesome in that way. My God, but in that TED talk, man, you opened up some things. For some who don't know, uh Pastor Mike did a TED talk um in Jacksonville, and it was called Black Murder is Normal. And man, you opened the eyes, and I want to ask you. What inspired that? What inspired you to just jump out there in that in that space and talk about that particular topic? So, um, you know, I think, um, and I don't want to sound over spiritual, uh, but I think it was something. Uh, it is part of what I'm, I'm born to do. If you believe in such a thing as purpose uh, or assignment, you know, I think sometimes we talk about purpose and we say it's one thing. I think it's many things that the Lord will lead us to do. Uh, and it is something that um, addressing issues like that, uh, trying to address uh, awareness of systemic issues, awareness of cultural issues, awareness of inequality uh, has kind of fallen into my lap. And um, I have a, excuse me, kind of a strange background. I grew up in kind of an all white world in uh, Orlando and then uh, dropped out of high school my senior year, relocated to the south side of Atlanta and spent the next 12 years kind of in a for lack of a better word, all black world um, and uh, different worlds, different America, different uh, different experiences, different definitions of normal, uh, different expectations. And uh, in that contrast, in the love that I received, the connection, the relationships that I built, uh, once I moved to uh, Jacksonville, so I left South Side of Atlanta after 12 years and went to start a church in Jacksonville, it was kind of like my my childhood world and my uh, ministry world from age 16 to about age 30, just 29, collided. And I saw uh, it all come together in Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a wonderful city. It's a big, small town, a lot of great things there. Also a lot of ugly and painful things, a lot of rich history, also a lot of very dark history. And so pastoring a diverse congregation, socioeconomically, ethnically, racially, uh, uh, you know, uh, age generationally uh, diverse uh, congregation, watching how that played into politics, watching how that played into um, uh, living uh, neighborhoods, um, uh, physical separation, economic separation, et cetera. All of those things went in. And in 2007, I uh, just got to a place where I, oh my great, <laughs> I'm going to be smarter than my technology, my whole Sorry, my Lord, it's always going to be. All right, I apologize. Uh, anyway, so I, uh, you got to be smarter than your equipment. Okay, so anyway, uh, in 2007, it all crashed into me at one time, and I started to speak on it and began to teach my church on race, racism, and religion, uh, dealing with everything from, uh, you know, uh, slavery to uh, economic uh, division to, I mean, just all the stuff. Uh, and all the way up to the present, Jacksonville at that time was the murder capital of Northeast Florida, the murder capital of Florida, excuse me, more homicides oh. per capita than any place else in the state. And it was a lead in many places in the nation. And out of all that frustration, out of all that burning and yearning and collision of the stories of my life, to compassion and just thought, how can the church not see this? How can how can mm -hmm. the church be indifferent to this? And started to speak on it. So long story short, I guess it's too late. Somebody from um, PBS was there uh, at, at one of the uh, things and said, hey, you know, this has changed my life. I'd like to come. I've never seen anything like this uh, and do a documentary. So they came and did a documentary on me. And several years later, uh, that same gentleman turned around and said, hey, Ted is coming to Jacksonville. I think you should do it. They approached me to do a talk, and uh, I said, nobody will be interested in what I have to say, and so I did it, and uh, the rest is history. I think uh, either in its main form or in different uh, pirated clips of it, it's been shared 10 million times or viewed 10 million times across the world, mm -hmm. and what's so funny is it was on Black Myrtle as normal and trying to denormalize um, the idea that criminality and hypersexuality are associated with blackness, which is really in the 
and the it deep in, in the concept, the uh, cultural concept of America, that blackness and those things are associated. And what was so funny is they approached me at the end of 13, would you give the talk at the end of 14? And I remember thinking, this is what I want to talk on. It may not even be relevant a year from now. And man, here we are eight years mm -hmm. removed. And sadly, mm -hmm. you when people share it now, they're like, this must have just came out. And it's, 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 I said nothing new. It had been around for a while. And sadly, what I've said is not old because it's still relevant today. It is, it is, man. And, you know, it's funny because I um, I follow a couple of uh, online comedians and one one of the comedians, he, he posted it on his uh, on his page. He said, what do you guys think about this? He said, man, this white on it, you know, it was like he's telling the truth. But, um, you know, you said this, you know, when President Obama was elected in 08, man, I heard you say this and you were so right. It's going to be an eye opener for America. You know, everybody was like, hey, hey, it's going to be a great revealer. And it sure was because people think, well, racism just showed up majorly. And no, no, no. It just revealed what we really had and nobody yeah. wanted to deal with it. No. And, and that's the thing I, I told. Um, I told my congregation, you know, because many were championing the idea of a post-racial America at that time. It's like, well, we got a black president. Uh, which there's a lot to that we can talk about another time. We got a black president, mm -hmm. so that should tell you that there's no problem here. And I was like, uh, just, just wait, just wait. You know, let's watch the bus stop. Let's see if the the, the economic demographics change. Let's watch the headline. I mean, this is deep, deep seated. This stuff is in our soil. It's in our air. It's in our cultural expectation. You know, as they say, let's not count. You know, what is it? Don't count your chickens with a hatchet or whatever that saying is. I said, let's not. Let's yeah, not. Uh, right. Let's not go so far. And I said. I, I, I said two things. I, we prayed over President Obama and his family that they would have a safe, uh, you know, term and service and, and two terms or whatever it is. And, um, you know, uh, issue free, life redeemed from destruction, you know, scandal free, blah, blah, blah. And the second thing I said is I believe uh, because of the limits of the political office, I don't believe you're going to see his full uh, efficacy in the prophetic while he's tied to these political things. I said, however, uh, I don't believe his term of service as president, and this is like within the first weeks of his election. I said, I don't believe mm -hmm. when his term is over, uh, uh, you know, that that it will fulfill the full prophetic mandate that I still think is waiting to be fulfilled, but that's another conversation. Uh, but I said, it will be a revealer. And a lot of the things you see, you're going to say, look what he created. This is not what he created. It is revealing the ugly underbelly, the things we've swept to the corners uh, and we've said were non-existent, but they weren't non-existent. They were just they were merely undisturbed. But 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 having mm -hmm. that and seeing that and reconciling what that meant, um, it, I don't even think it stirred up anything. It just peeled back what was there. So I told my church his presidency will be known as the great. He will be the great revealer. And man, and then it came with all the stuff and the Trayvon and the Mark uh, Jordan Davis. I mean, it just kept pouring and pouring. And um, people are like, man, what's going on? What's going on? Well, it's not what's happening. It's that we're finally seeing what's happening and ugliness in our collective consciousness that we thought was behind us. Uh, it was right there just in the uh, in the dark corners, the unswept corners of our national consciousness. Jesus Christ, man. And, and even in the, in the TED talk, you were addressing the uh, just the things that 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 was revealing, very, greatly revealing, because you and Pat County did a, a, you paid your own money, uh, did that whole a yeah. study that the majority of things that we hear on most of the black radio was about killing, murder. Uh, just go in a little bit about that, man, because that that revealed a lot. And that's not that was just your city. Let's talk about you yeah, know, yeah. Lot what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So that started. So out of this. Um, so it kind of came out when I was looking at all these homicides and I started to look at what did my city look like? What was the national disparity? What was the. Uh, you know, uh, sta local, state, national disparity. And I started looking at poverty, HIV, AIDS, uh, homicide, um, uh, infant mortality, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I just get this idea of two different Americas and then dealing with what the roots are, et cetera. And we looked at music. And, you know, my thing about music is I don't believe music is the cause of anything. I think it's the, it's the canary in the coal mine um, about what's happening. I think you can look into the art of a, of a nation, the art of a people, uh, and, uh, you know, we look at the art of America and what does that art tell us about our expectation? What does that art tell us about our definitions of normalcy? And I said, you can go up and down the aisle, uh, the dial in every direction on your FM radio and you will find no uh, station broadcasting young white males glorifying, amplifying uh, uh, glamorizing or trivializing the murder of other white males. I mean, statistically, it is so rare 
to even hear that. As a matter of fact, when white male artists do it, many times they're accused of acting black. They're accused of pretending mm -hmm. they're something they're not. Mm -hmm. But the stations branded for young black audiences, marketed to young black audiences, contain stuff that you will find. So you could have Clear Channel, Radio One, um, Salem, or some of these other big broadcast things. I can't think of them all the time. The big conglomerates, they'll have six stations on a dial. And the only one that contains the murder, the violence, the drugs, uh, AK-47's assault, you know, uh, literal denigration of women, the only station that they have in their entire network of stations in each major uh, ADI or DMA or whatever it is, uh, is branded for their young black audiences. As a matter of fact, you'll find crossover artists who are on that station branded for young black listeners who are also uh, on the station branded for young white listeners, the same artist, but the content by, you know, artist A on one station is completely different than the content by the same artist A on a station branded for young white listeners. And, uh, and it's kind of like there's a music that it's so ingrained in our expectation that, of course, it would come from and be branded as and targeted towards uh, uh, and associated with blackness because in our cultural consciousness, blackness, hypercriminality, hypersexuality, they are one. And so I, I tried to get into the boardrooms and say, look, have you listened to this? Is this is this reflective of your brand? Is this reflective of your corporate values? Uh, and and they basically laughed me out of the boardrooms going, well, you know, it's 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 the music they make. It's the music right. they like. And I said, yeah, but they, 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 they want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is what. We, and, you know, and I said, well, if they made songs about dog fighting, would you let it on? Well, no. I, well, if they made songs about rape, would they let it on? Well, no. If you made songs about, uh, 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 you know, uh, killing children, would you would you know, would you leave? No, we wouldn't do that at all. Well, what about the songs that glamour glorify killing young black men? And they said, well, you know, it depends on who makes it. You know, we don't we don't really you know, we don't want to we don't want to censor art. And, and you find that the art itself is a symptom of a sickness. The, the 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 interest of the listener is a symptom of a sickness. The corporate the the financial profit profitability is a symptom of a sickness. And I just said, you know, I see you guys have standards of what you'll air. I mean, I said, what if I, I said, what if I make music about killing Jews? No. What if I make music about killing homosexuals? I mean, would you say to me again, well, we don't want to censor art? You would say, no, that's awful. But no one can even hear the normalcy that if you go up and down the uh, a dial, the only thing you'll hear talked about glamorized glorified of murdering is a young black man and so that i realize is a leftover it's a hangover of this idea of blackness criminality hypersexuality being connected the, the the lesser value perceived value of black life and it's this is what makes it racism it's not prejudice it's not discrimination it's racism it exists in the unchecked and unchallenged normal right that it's that it's just out there and, and you say something to somebody they go is there something wrong with that i mean and you can't even hear it you know you can't even hear it. So that led to the to what we call the air quality experiment. Uh, that led to the TED Talk, and that led to the Do Better movement, which was just saying, look, um, can all of us who make art, create art, consume art, produce art, advertise and broadcast art really think about the inequity within this art? That what we're saying is, you know, somebody said, well, I don't see where the racism is. Well, find out why you can't find white people singing about it. Find mm -hmm. out why you don't find it because we have relegated the them to, to that. And, and even I know testimonies of of people who have said their label said, look, can you to their young black artists? We like what you're doing, but you, you need to thug it up a little. You need to you know, we need a little wow. more gangster, a little more edge. Why? Because in the American cultural script, that's your role. That's the role you play. I mean, that's what well, that's the role we have for you. And um, and you'll find the artists themselves are really not like. I mean, obviously, if somebody's really shooting and killing people and 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 you know cutting off heads and and you know putting out fifty thousand dollars to kill another, you know, kill them, but we would say, well, no way. Mm -hmm. Um, well, why? Who told them that was what they should pretend to be? And and the way you know it's the systemic, the deep deep issues is show me the white people that are pretending. And white people, white artists will do. They'll pretend to be Satanists. They'll bite animals' heads off. They'll cut them. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the, the crazy, you know, and even Eminem, Eminem comes out as a crazy, as suicide, drugs, mm -hmm. you know, all this other mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I got a body in my basement, kind of a Marilyn Manson type yeah, thing. Yeah. But he doesn't go into the, I'm a drug dealer with an AK, you know, because we haven't assigned that to the young white male. Because that's right. not what our norm. And the fact that that really is what the streets look like. I mean, the, the murder rate among people of color, brown and black, is 30 times that of, mm -hmm. of uh, white Americans. So we say, well, they're just singing about the streets, but, but they're not lamenting it. They're not protesting it. They're not standing against it. They're trivializing it, and, and, uh, and which opens up a whole other thing as to, as to why Walmart would want to be, you know, say, we'll put our name on it. You know, they, Walmart right, would right. run if, 
If uh, Apple, you know, Tim Cook, if you put out songs glorifying the murder of homosexuals, Apple <laughs> music wouldn't touch that with a hundred foot pole. Uh, at all. But they, they got, they have, I mean, 5 million songs that glamorize and glorify. You know, a woman says she's pregnant. I'll kick her right in the stomach, kill that baby. I'm not going to raise no bastard child and all that stuff. You're not getting me, you blank and hoe. That is on there right now. You can buy it right now. And mm -hmm. no one even bats an eye. You get laughed at. It's like, what's wrong with that? And the reason there's nothing wrong with that is it doesn't touch the sensitivity of the power structure. It doesn't agitate the moral sensibility of the power structure. Whereas a song about school shootings would, or a song about dog fighting would, a song about date rape would touch the soul sensitivity of the power structure. And these artists get their hands slapped for touching it. But as long as it's black, branded black, uh, uh, devaluing black, then, then we're totally at peace with it. And that itself is, is evidence of the dark powers that are at work. And what we who are people of Christ should be confronting those dark powers and, and, and bringing sight to the blind and light to those in darkness. And even, you know, even with that, man, you know, I find that there's resistance there. But um, when you come down, I, now I don't want to, not tonight, not tonight, we're not going to get political, but even when you come down to the evangelicals, they don't see, I've talked to certain evangelicals, white evangelicals, and they don't see the problem there. And so, so they said, well, we're all one, but there's still a, there's still that issue that is lying, like you said, that underbelly of America, there's still that racism that's there. I had a, a, a dispute with one of, one of my good guys, he's a good guy on social media, uh, when I post something, um, that our definition of racism is, is two different things. And I said, well, I'll give you some racism. And he, he gave me his definition. I said, that's not what racism is, man. That's that's right. right. But he had his own definition of what it was. And, you know, certain folks, they don't see it. I talked to certain um, people and they said, well, I can see things, but I don't understand. But then there's that resistance that comes, man, that resistance. And like you said in one of your um, interviews, you know, um, racism is not something that, okay, if we're, it's the silence. By not yeah. saying anything or not doing anything, it still perpetuates and it's increasing. Yeah. Well, you have to, so, so in a strange way, and I know this is going to be difficult, um, mm. we're actually doing better than we've, than we've ever done as a nation. I mean, the world is in general less violent now than it's ever been. Uh, in America, there's better opportunity than there's ever been. There's less mm -hmm. racial divide than there's ever been. And of course, you can argue statistics, you know, but but we, we don't even have murder rates in 2020 like we had in 1970. I mean, it's uh, I mean, uh, the, the crime is down. Violent crime is down, blah, blah, blah. Now, year over year, four years, decade over decade. Yes. But what we've not come anywhere close to where we were. 25, 30 years ago, uh, you know, the early, late 80s and early 90s. I mean, a thousand homicides a year in Miami, a thousand homicides a year in New York, two and three thousand. I mean, we're, we're just not, we're just not, we're nowhere near that. Uh, but no matter where you go on the sliding scale of time, you'll never find a year. You will not find a year in which black people were not overrepresented in the area of homicide, victimization, and perpetration. You'll never find that. It does not exist. You go back in the 70s, you go back in the 60s, you go back in the 50s, you go back in the 40s, 20s, whatever. And the question is why? You'll not find a time with, um, uh, you know, family structure or HIV. I mean, in the 30 years of dealing with HIV, you will not find a time in which black Americans are not overrepresented in those statistics, mm -hmm. uh, blah, blah, blah. You, it doesn't exist. So from the theistic perspective, if we accept that all human beings are made in the image of God, made in his image and likeness, and that all human beings, when they when they breach when they break the matrix and come into the world from the womb, that they're all image bearers of God, and yet over time we see this consistent um, pooling of neg negative uh, social indicators, suspiciously pooling among one group. You have to pause and ask yourself. It's a very it's a very simple question. A very simple question. This is what it comes down to: Is there something genetically inherently wrong with them? Or is there something wrong with us? Which means, mm -hmm. is it something that you can point a finger at and say, well, they, 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 or do you step back and say, is this world, is this nation, is the floor even? Mm -hmm. um, and individually, you say, well, you know, you're trying, to, you're trying to blame all the problems on racism. Well, no, on the individual side, you lay the responsibility square where it belongs, on mm -hmm. the shoulders of the individual who chose to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But exactly. when you step back, you have the individual accountability, but now you have the 
the cultural responsibility and how do we, it's like saying, it's like saying, you know, women, women outnumber sex workers, you know, I mean, a hundred men, sex workers, a hundred to one. We say, well, what is it in women that just wants to sell their body? Well, if women are also image bearers uh, uh, and we say, well, you know, what, what tides, what feed, what head springs, what, what, what cultural nourishing places are nourishing these ideas because, you know, and you know this from, from your background, uh, uh, no, no action is self-originating, right? So choices right. precede actions and mindsets precede choices and words and images create ideas and culture and norm. What is it about American culture that not only, um, not only has this, but perpetuated? I mean, we've done everything we can money and schools and intervention and marches and blah, 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 blah. And, 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 and I mean, just all, all that can be done over. There's never been a day in my lifetime when, when the, the numbers of homicide and, and incarceration, it's never been a day in my lifetime, mm -hmm. not in my mm -hmm. father's lifetime, not in my grandfather's lifetime, not in his grandfather's lifetime, where it hasn't been this thing. And, and people who deal with systemic issues and who, who ascribe to the idea of systemic racism, they realize that unless they hold to that, then, then, then we have to go to an uglier answer that the, the, uh, uh, theological-minded uh, uh, image Christ-bearing uh, or Christ-minded people cannot accept, which is maybe there's something wrong with him. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. just this is what black people are. Maybe this is who they are at their, at their DNA level. And, mm -hmm. and we cannot accept that. We you must accept right. what is feeding this idea. Where is this coming from? And and now you can step back and we say, well, it's black culture. There's no such thing. It's white culture. There's no such thing. As soon as you start saying this is black culture, this is white culture, you're going to have to say, well, which parts? I don't remember Reggie White got in trouble all those years ago uh, playing. I think he was playing for the Packers at the time. It was the Eagles. I'm not sure he's playing for it. But he said, well, you know, Mexicans are good at family and whites are good at business and blacks right. are good at it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, OK, I know I appreciate what you're trying to say. You know, he's <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. Well, we all have different gifts. But, you know, these this is all fallacy. This is all ridiculousness, of course. So, so at the, at the micro level, it's individual choice, but at the macro level, what is feeding the normalcy? And that's been my work to denormalize the expectation. Because if, if I were to ask you 10 years ago, who, if I were to ask you 25 years ago, uh, who currently is overrepresented in homicide, which group of Americans you said, well, black Americans, you know, probably 40 to one. And if I were to say to you, tell me in 10 years, who you think it'll be, tell me who in 20 years you think it'll be. And right mm -hmm. now, John, if it right now, depending on the stats, it's 30 to one. And there's a lot of census data and things like that. Somewhere between nine to one overrepresentation and 30 to one. We would consider it a great, huge moral victory if we got it to five to one. But five right. to one is still evidence of a dysfunction. If we yeah. were somehow by a miracle in the next five years to get it to three to one, we say well, three to one, we're doing better. But we still those of us who believe in the image of Christ say there's still something wrong. What is feeding it? What dark powers, what structures, what systems are feeding it? And to attack those structures until you can look out. And maybe you can't get it one to one. Maybe there will always be a majority and a minority. There will always be those in the power structure. I, I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if you can ever get it completely equal. But the theory, the pursuit, what we should aim for, it's it's like, um, oh, what's the phrase that I like uh, where you try to get the zero uh, harm reduction, right? What is the acceptable number of opioid overdoses in America? How many can, what's acceptable? The answer is zero. zero we may right. never get to zero. We may never mm -hmm. get to zero, but what can we do in every sphere to get as close to zero mm -hmm. as possible? And so that's and there's always going to be murder. There's always as long as there are human beings, there's always going to be murder by course of passion and jealousy and pro property. And, and, but but what's agitated where we're pouring gasoline? How do we denormalize the gasoline so that so that if you scoop in your hand in America and pick up a bucket of America, that what's in your hand and what's in prison and what's in poverty and what's in home, that they look similar to the big picture and to strive for that to me, seems to be uh, central with the cause of Christ. Man, you talk about the cause of Christ. I, I remember back almost 30 years ago, um, I was heavy into, uh, you know, I'm wearing my my, my kufis and my my, my my dad with the Africa on it. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in it, man. I'm in it, you know. And then, uh, you know, you, life just speaks to you. Things start happening in life. And so um, I need to rededicate. Long story short, I need to rededicate my life back to Christ. And I did. And uh, I know, Pastor Mike, I kind of got around some folks that were telling me, you know, simmer down, you know, um, Christ loves everybody, which is true. Um, you know, this stuff, you're being talked to by the wrong people, you know, and some of that, some of that was wrong, right and some of that was wrong. But then I started to, you know, go to church and I'm going to segue into something else here, which I know is a passion of yours, too. Uh, 
I started getting myself around folks that I didn't know at the time was religious. And so now we got this religion going on. And so as much as I saw some of the wrong going on in society, I'm starting to get, get in the church. But then I got, you know, I'm thinking they're telling me I'm free. Well, now you read your life back to Christ, you're free. So, okay, you're free. Don't worry about all that stress and stuff with racism. We're free Christ. And I found out they were putting me more in bondage because now, oh, oh, you can't listen to Kirk Franklin. But wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. What do you mean? Jumping all around? What's good as that? I couldn't listen to Kirk Franklin. I couldn't listen yeah. to the whinings. Uh, and so now I want to talk about some of this, the religion, <laughs> man. I, I couldn't go to Disney movies. <laughs> I, I couldn't do oh, none yeah. of this stuff. Oh, and I'm yeah. thinking, I'm thinking yeah. oh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going yeah. to church. What are you? The devil. And the devil is this, the devil is that. Man, I want to talk about this religious thin line because there's some of us, some folks that are listening to me today are watching this. Uh, you in church and we're saying we're free in Christ, but we're really in bondage. <laughs> yeah. And, well, uh, that's, that's big. Um mm. You know, to me, there's a lot of fundamental misunderstanding of the person of Christ, a fundamental misunderstanding of the work of Christ, uh, and how we got so caught up in these false concepts of vertical piety that we really missed um, the essence of what it should have been. What you know, I think what should have been, and, and I've been thinking recently a lot about this. But Christ is not a threat to the individual. You know, um, even in his earthly ministry, individuals had no problem with him. Right. Um, why? Because he heals, and he feeds, and he affirms, and he forgives. He's only a threat to uh, religious political power structures. The religious mm. power structures, mm. the political power mm. structures. Mm. Now there's a problem because he supplants them. He, 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 you know, champions complete dignity, non-tribalism, non-nationalism. I mean, you have to understand that the 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 culmination, the omega of Christ, is simply. Uh, that there's no more war, that they beat their swords into plowshare, there's no more poverty, uh, that there's food for the nations, that there's peace, there's nonviolence. I mean, this is where it goes. But to do that, you have to disrupt the controlling powers that be and the very controlling powers who are controlled by the dark powers uh, uh, that bring bondage and, and deception, etc. So, so since that is the essence of Christ's mission, since his resurrection is the inauguration of new creation, since uh, the resurrection of Christ, I've been thinking recently, is the second big bang, right? The entire uh, a microcosmos within the cosmos is unleashed at his resurrection, and it is to transform uh, individuals who thereby transform every seed of religious and political power and the denormalization of tribalism and nationalism and racism and, uh, you know, their God, our God, their, you know, th this all is supposed to be initiated in the, in the new creation, but that is very quickly swallowed up and it's mm -hmm. replaced by the concept of God, which says it's not about universal human dignity. It's not about uh, bringing forth the kingdom, the, 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 the reunification between the heaven and the earth realm, uh, full dignity, uh, people are fed, there's no war, there's no race. That's not what it's about. It's about being vertically aligned. What are we doing or not doing that could get us in trouble with God? So in the apps, in this vacuum of understanding what Christianity should be, understanding this evolutionary idea of the seed that eventually affects every, or the leaven that eventually affects every sphere uh, and brings dignity and, you know, and no more racism, no more poverty, no more slavery, and, and all these other kind of things, no more uh, gender inequality, all the things that Christ in his earthly life you know, modeled, taught, championed his actions, even speak louder than some of the words we've attributed to him. In, the, in that vacuum, if that's not what we're doing, then what are we doing? Well, we got to make sure you don't do anything to anger God or you're not on the them side. Well, you can't mm -hmm. go to Disney. Why? Because, well, they have the they have their pride day and and, uh, and uh, that's for gays. And if you're going to do that, you're going to be with the gays or, you know, you, you know, you can't you can't eat this food. I mean, on Old National, where I grew up and went to church on the south side of Atlanta College Park, they had a, a Yassin's fish place, which was run by Muslims. And they're like, don't eat uh, fish at Yassin's, man. You don't want to contribute to the devil. I mean, it's all every everything is the devil. So we're not really preoccupied, you know, or or Procter and Gamble. I don't remember when Procter and Gamble was like, don't yeah. have any products by Procter and Gamble. You know, it's, yeah. uh, and. and so, so it all becomes, you know, let's not do anything to upset God, which is all rooted in a false concept of God, right? It's rooted in a filtered idea of God, that God is the God that's going to burn everybody down, kill everybody, kill, you know, if you had an adultery, he's going to kill the baby just to teach you. All these mm -hmm. concepts of God that were, uh, 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 you know, weaponized, tribalized, the people didn't understand the nature of God, etc. And then Christ comes and reveals the true nature of the Father, these forgiving beyond anything we ever thought. He's gracious, but he's the healer. He's not the cursor, all these things. But rather than change our idea of God, 
we just put the, the name of Christ onto a flawed idea of the nature of God. And so therefore yeah. you can't go to movies, you know, God will strike you dead and you can't, you know, you, you can't have Harry Potter books in your house or, you know, God will put a curse on you. Where do we get that from? Uh, 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 looking at God behind the veil of the Old Testament scripture. And we don't even let Christ, we don't even take the written scriptures and funnel them through the person of Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. And not only that, but the living spirit of Christ, which lives in us, which affirms dignity and affirms humanity and, and champions equality. So now you have a whole church go out into the world instead of initiating the end time view of no war, no racism, no sexism, no nationalism. They're instituting. Let's get as many people on the right team before God gets, you know, before our drunken yeah. God wakes up from his from his bender and starts beating the kids. Uh, and so therefore, what, 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 why didn't we want you to have Disney? Because if our drunken God gets up when you're at Disney, he's going to come start beating the kids and you don't. And so it's a false concept of God, a false reading of Christ that has led to this dysfunction. And so if we pull people out of Angola and enslave them, better that they be enslaved here in the states where they can hear some Bible stories and their eternal soul be redeemed than to be stuck over there in those pagan lands and bust hell wide open. So we rationalize and we justify all of the evil done under the banner of Christ when in fact it has absolutely nothing to do with the person of Christ. And so we made it all about, you know, did you wear a hill figure shirt or not? Or did you have, you know, whatever, whatever. And I remember my parents came in my room one night. My parents came in my room one night. I had an Aladdin shirt. They threw that out. I had a Beauty and the Beast VHS. They threw that out. I had a Batman shirt. They threw that out. They had a, they had two goats. They had a daddy goat. Uh, and uh, a daddy ram and a little baby ram uh, feeding on a mountain, a little statue. And they came out and said, where's the statue? That's a ram. The ram's a symbol of the devil. We got to get that out of our house. That's an idol in our house. And this yeah. is in the, in the, listen, in the absence of the true essence of Christ, you got to make it up. You got to make religion mm -hmm. about something. So the Pharisees, they were always concerned with don't upset the father. Don't upset the father. Mm -hmm. He's going to destroy. So I said, and they were like, you healed on the wrong day or you're eating the wrong food or, and, and you shouldn't do that. And you know, you're, you're going to upset the father. And Christ keeps saying, look, man, look in your own heart, man. If you'd help a dog out, you're not going to help a human being out. Right. I mean, right, you're a father. Right. What would you want for your kids? And they couldn't hear because they would rather hold on to their flawed concept of God rather than change their idea of who God was. They tried to enforce their vertical piety. They chose to kill God, right, rather than change their idea of God. So is it any wonder 2,000 years later, you, you know, you're nervous that you saw a PG-13 movie made by Disney. You know, you might be upsetting the God that was, you know, blowing up all the homosexuals in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's it, we, we've got to let the person of Christ transform our notions of God. And it's very difficult. The Pharisees struggled with it. They couldn't do it. Saul of Tarsus couldn't do it. As a matter of fact, he committed murder in the name of God out of loyalty to God because he didn't want God getting upset and, and delaying the arrival of the Messiah. And man, when right. he came in contact with the living Christ, it changed his whole idea. And he said, man, mm -hmm. God is much bigger than I thought. And, and, and he spent his whole life rethinking his concept of God. And we should be picking up with that, rethinking our concept of God in light of the person of Christ instead of these petty vertical obsessions uh, 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 and and which are re largely empty and have kept us for in my mind for a lot of years uh, not in a new big bang cosmos of new creation and transforming the world uh, but you know in kind of the old idea of well let's do what we can do so you know vote right so God doesn't unleash his curses or vote right so that God doesn't take away the blessing <laughs> right. uh, you know you right. know you always want to vote even even if even if the devil's crowd wins at least you vote right God won't put the curse on you all of these ideas that Christ should have changed for us, uh, but but we don't let him do it. You know, it's funny, funny he said, my, my mama did that same thing, man. We we struggled financially, and uh, she had somebody, we found a church, a local church, and they came in. Man, they said, you got to clean your house. So they pointed out stuff. We had, you know, I don't know about your house. I know my house, man. We collected those ebonies, you know, with all these black ebonies and jets. She threw all those away. Any song, any record 45 that said uh, something with black in it. Man, I'm saying you gotta be kidding me. So there's a couple of records I went and snuck back in the room. Maybe that's why we stayed broke. I don't know because I snuck that See, stuff back. It in. was your fault, John. You owe your mom an apology. Look at that. You kept you, you kept yeah, the curse. Kept us broke. Yeah. Kept us broke. Oh my god. They, they're gonna have well, to get know, you like Aiken. They're gonna have to take you out and kill you like Aiken, man. You were the problem. <laughs> I know, right? You stole me, man. Right? Search, search. We only had two rooms, so it would have been fucked if my sister didn't have it. I, I, I'm the mm, one that kept, right. the, kept the apology, you buried man. it under your bed. We know what you did. <laughs> You know, man, you talk about that. I mean, even with Paul and his struggle. Remember, he was, uh, you know, struggling with Peter. And Peter didn't want to hear that stuff. You know, Jesus had to talk to Peter and say, hey, man, you can eat this. You got Peter told Jesus, you got to be kidding. I can't eat this. Yeah. Because they were yeah. still living under that bondage of what we can and can't do. And then Jude, uh, you people talked on this. Uh, they had to come there and find out, okay, let's hear about these guys being free. What's, what the heck is this? To spy yeah. out their liberty that they were so free 
doing things yeah. that was different that, you know, um, the church, so to speak, the Pharisees kept in bondage. And even some of the old disciples trying to keep us in bondage because they didn't renew their minds. Yeah. And again, they, they weren't bad. They were they were doing what they perceived to be loyalty to God. I mean, they didn't want to curse on their nation, right? They read mm-hmm. the Old Testament scriptures. They see in, you know, in black and white what it says to do. And Paul suggesting that maybe circumcision isn't isn't a thing. Maybe physical circumcision is a thing. He's like, look, I've been around and I've, as I traveled the Gentile world, he said, I'm raised in, I'm a Roman citizen, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. I was raised in Jerusalem, but, you know, Cilicia, Tarsus, uh, all these Roman Greek backgrounds I've got. I speak multiple languages. I'm a man of the world. He goes, you know, I really think about it. I've seen people whose foreskin was intact that, that showed forth the image of God as image bearers of God. And, and walked in that empathetic commandment to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he said, then I met other people whose foreskins have been clipped according to the written scripture, and I don't see that evidence of them as image bearers walking mm-hmm. in that, you know, that, that natural religion of love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he said, I'm starting to think that true circumcision is a heart matter, not a foreskin matter. And, and they mm-hmm. can't handle it. You know, they're just the, mm-hmm. you know, Paul, what are you talking about? You're crazy. I mean, you, you're going to try to change what's written. He said, I'm not. I'm not trying to change what's written. I'm just evaluating what's written and rethinking what's written in the light of he who lives. And that mm-hmm. is the entire essence of the incarnation. That is the entire essence of the Holy Spirit and new creation uh, being poured out at the resurrection at Pentecost, that you and I are mm-hmm. now rethinking our flawed view of what we understand. We rethink what's written. You know, we 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 were trained that, you know, if you put, if you want to see God, you put the scripture and you put the scripture in your face, right? And and through mm-hmm. this scripture, you open it, and and you'll see God. And the problem is, the scripture presents a veiled, obscured idea of God. I mean, it's one place God's a killer, one place God's a forgiver, one place you know it's like right, right, it's right. like it's like it's like you know uh, 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 Yahweh is the is the drunken, crazy, racist, prejudiced nationalist. I'll kill everybody <laughs> side of God, and Jesus is the nice little. Come on, man, he's not like you know. And 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 of course, now that Christ, you know, by His Spirit, and even before the scriptures were written. Christ was dealing with people. It's how Joseph knew not to sleep with his master's wife, right? right. He says, right, I can't do right. that. I mean, why? Because God lives, because we're made in the image of likeness of God. So now instead Jesus. of going to the scripture and hope to see God, we, by the living spirit of Christ, look into the scripture. And for the first time, Saul of Tarsus, who had been looking, you know, trying to understand God this way, now he sees Christ and he goes back. He goes, guys, we've misunderstood it. I see the, I now understand the writing. And, 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 and Peter had it to a degree, but they weren't bad people. James wasn't a bad person. Uh, the Pharisees right. who were insisting, they just didn't want Israel to get cursed because their understanding was if you don't obey Torah, if you don't honor the temple, uh, if you're not a loyal Jew, that God's going to put us back in bondage. And man, we're already occupied by the Romans. We barely have a, 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 a shoestring agreement to let us have freedom of religion. We got our temple. But they knew Daniel's prophecy that, that an abomination would be in the temple. They didn't want to risk that happening. And, and so right. what? We got these people suggesting that there's that the, the written scriptures don't mean what they say. There's something deeper to them. Saul says, we got to kill him. Why? Because God would want them dead, right? Samson, right? We take the jawbone of an ass or Elijah, we mm-hmm. call down fire or Phineas, we, mm-hmm. we go stab the, you know, stop the plague. So let me go commit violence in the name of God. And he was doing because in the veiled scriptures, uh, the scriptures that should be designed to reveal God, they can actually stand in the very way of seeing him. And Jesus said, look, no man, John 1 says, nobody has seen God at any time. But John says, but the son has revealed not his supposed nature and identity, but his true identity. And we've lost the centrality of Christ. We throw Christ, the person of Christ, in a box with all these other verses. And you can't throw them in a box. You've got to yeah. hold Christ's person up and then take everything in the box and pass it through the filter of who he is. And uh, when you don't get that, religion becomes about, you know, escaping hell and being on the right team and, you know, mm-hmm. voting for the right person. God's going to get us. And, you know, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, well, so, so a bunch of people in Beirut died. I mean, they, God doesn't care about them as much. They're not really in God's image because they're not Great Britain, Australia, Israel, or Nigeria. I mean, this is the darkness and it's the very darkness that Christ came to resolve. I believe the very darkness that Paul was trying to undo. Um, but we've just replaced it with, you know, don't go to movies and don't listen to secular music. Yeah, don't 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 get a tattoo. Um, don't yeah. you know? It's interesting, you know. Don't when they talk about don't get a tattoo, they go to but Leviticus nineteen, and they talk yeah. about that same scripture talks about don't mar the side of your beards. That means I can't get a shape up, you know. Right, right. So, I, you yeah. know, so I'm eating a hot dog, quoting this scripture, and right there I'm violating the same thing because we don't have an understanding. Like you said, we throw it all in one one box and we put 
Jesus on top of it and say, it's a, hey, a, hey, you're going to go to hell. You're going to, you know, you're dying. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. It's uh, when you, when you, when you fail to see Christ clearly, a wrong concept of Christ gives you a wrong concept of God. A wrong concept of Christ gives you a wrong concept of humanity. A wrong concept of humanity, you have a wrong concept of the church. You divide between us and them. And Jesus is trying to say, look, he's the father of all. He makes his sun shine on the just and the unjust, blah, blah, blah. And we take that scripture and then almost this radical assertion, right? Uh, Brother mm-hmm. Crosden said this radical assertion of how good God is and how divine his love is, but then the normalcy of civilization subverts that, you know? So God is so anti-corruption and slavery that he frees the Jews and says, you know, this is wrong. What you're doing, Egypt, it's wrong. But once Israel becomes a nation, you know, they're conquering people. What do we do with these people? And they start to write scriptures and say, well, you know, just be nice to them. It's like, wait a minute, if slavery was wrong, it can't be wrong for just a select group of people, but the right. radical nature of God's love and dignity and universal humanity gets subverted by nationalized, tribalized, ethnicized what ideas of God. And so Paul comes out and he's like, look, you know, you can't, there's no such thing as slaves or cri- uh, slaves or masters anymore, male, female, bond free, barbarian, Scythian, Jew, Greek. He says, now that Christ has come, we have a new understanding of the world. But by the time Ephesians comes along and, and, and Ephesians gets passed down through the church ages and the copies that we have of it, it, it it's, it's too much of a threat to Rome, right? It's too much of a threat to the Roman economy to suggest there should be no slavery. So it gets edited a little bit. So Paul in Philemon yeah. says, look, you can't be a Christian person and own other people. You can't do that. That's not right. in harmony with Christ. And he says, let that man go, not because he's your property. Take him home now, not as property, but as an equal human being. That's the radicality. But by the time it gets to Ephesians, you know, they start messing with the verse a little bit. And instead of su- the suggestion of Galatians, there's no male nor female, bond nor free, slave. Nor, instead of that, we get a compromise. Well, there can be Christian slave owners. They should just be very Christian about it, right? And so it gets, it, why? Because that gets normal because, because the threat of there ought to be no slaves now that the new creation has been done, that's a threat to political power. And that okay. suggestion is it's, it's money, right? It's money. The dark powers, they can't have that. So we just soften Paul a little. We don't mean, he, he doesn't mean no slavery or no masters. He just meant not ugly masters, not ugly slavery. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, but we've got to have enough sense to know that what we know to be true in our own hearts, that we don't submit what we know to be true by Christ's spirit in our lives to the written scriptures. We submit the written scriptures with what we know to be true. And there were many people, you know, in America, in, you know, the 18, 1700s, 1800s, 1600s, that were like, look, mm-hmm. you can't be a Christian and own slaves. It, they're not compatible. Right. And, and somebody say, well, it's written right here. And the same thing happened in 1617, 1800 America that was happening in Jesus' earthly ministry. They were saying, well, well, I'm just going with what's written. But but he who lives is higher than what's written. And these Quakers and these people would say, you can't own a slave and call yourself a person of Christ. They were like, of course I can. Paul said right here, they said, we're not limiting our understanding of God to something written in Ephesians. We don't know who's handled that. We, we don't know. And somebody said, well, you're going to change Ephesians? We have to reconcile every verse to what we know to be true about the love of God, the nature of God, the full of affirmation of dignity of human beings. But man, those weaponized scriptures become weaponized religions, become weaponized doctrines. And instead of new a second big bang at the resurrection, instead of a new microcosmos affirming dignity, equality, a, a, aiming for and pressing for the realization of heaven and earth reuniting, no, no war, no famine, no poverty. We didn't do that. We spent 2,000 years weaponizing, tribalizing, submitting the radicality of God to the normalcy of flawed human systems and civilization which is why we're having the conversations we're having now, which you would think we would have been moved on from those conversations 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. But it's rinse and repeat. Wow. Yeah, uh, for those who don't know, we're we're talking to um, Pastor Michael T. Smith, and I'll tell you, man, I I look so so forward to having this conversation. Now now I'm going to throw something out here. We're talking about bondage. I'm going to talk about Christian marriage. And Mm. let's, let's get into that. Now, if... You guys ain't ready for this. Fasten your seatbelts, <clears throat> or just log off. Don't log off. Don't log off. Yeah, I told you, share it out. Share it out. You and Pastor Connie, I will tell you when you guys start talking about great married sex, man. Mm-hmm. I think when I first heard it, I giggled and laughed. See, that shows how 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 religious you can be with church with certain things, man. Because I felt like a little kid, like <laughs> I'm looking around the room. Anybody, like you know, sure, you talking about this. And when I start playing for my wife Karen. She's in the car. She's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because you guys are so open and free. But right. then I'm in bondage because I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, if I, if I can't hear this, you know. So you've written a couple of books. Um, yeah. One book is 
I, I, I'm, I'm putting out here how to eat the peach. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, man. The, the man. proper way to eat a peach. Yes, sir. The proper way to eat a peach, man. And so, uh, see, some folks are going, wait a minute. Is that what I think he's talking about? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, it is. So you have to buy the book. Yeah, they have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> <laughs> man, go ahead and talk about that, man, because I know you get some backlash with even some of the stuff you talk about with marriage, because one of the things that I found out is, you know, it's deeper than just the sex. You know, you get deeper than that. Oh, and man. You really talk about, talk about the souls, which makes the sex better. So, yeah. So, so, um, you know, Khan and I believe in the dignity of um, sexual equality, sexual personhood, that male sexuality and female sexuality are equal, that both are by divine design, that that uh, fem female sexuality is not an afterthought. You know, it's not like, well, men are sexual objects and women should just orbit them, you know. And so we, we, we believe in the idea of sexual Eden, uh, the four walls of sexual Eden, uh, you know, servanthood in the bedroom. Uh, Dignity, mutuality, in the, you know, uh, uh, in the bedroom, uh, love in the bedroom, and exclusivity. You know that that here, when it's just us and God, uh, that if it's just us internally and externally, no comparison, no outside, no dragging others in in uh, in mind or body. Uh, that there is liberty here, and that it was God's idea. That the parts are God's idea. Their function is God's idea. Uh, their enjoyment is God's idea, and uh, that they are God's idea for man and woman. And again, denormalizing, denormalizing the stigma, denormalizing the shame, you know, that a vagina was God's idea, right? The penis was God's idea. Ejaculation is God's idea. These are not, this is not, oh, it's not up to us, it's not of God to renew his mind to the standards of beauty and brilliance. We have to renew our mind, right? And the mm -hmm. awkwardness and the clumsiness and the beauty and the uh, the sight, sound, smell, taste, feeling of intimacy, the heat, the temperature, uh, uh, you know, the the all, all the 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 sweet, the sour, everything in between uh, is is by design. And so, instead of again affirming shame, instead of affirming uh, God's displeasure, uh, Connie and I feel well. Two things. Number one, we feel like. Um, uh, there's a lot of unnecessary bondage, a lot of inequality, a lot of the idea of from this world throwing gasoline on male sexuality and throwing water on on female sexuality, which we don't like. But then also the responsibility we have that the life we actually live, a life that we live in our marriage bed, a life that we try to reconcile with the, the personality of Christ, uh, that we don't hide that because it's not mm -hmm. fair if Connie and I are enjoying a liberty in our marriage bed. Um but we don't say anything about it all the while knowing that other people are shamed because they're having those same thoughts, same feelings, and same experiences. So, so we refuse to partner with the devil to say, well, you know, Connie and I do this. We enjoy this. Connie and I are all over lovers. We consider all of it to be good. It's just us alone. Uh, you know, when we got married, we were a lot smaller than we were, than we are now. And, uh, uh, you know, we were a lot younger and I was a lot less, you know, my hair I had more hair and wasn't as gray and all this kind of stuff. But listen to me, I'm just as much a sexual being as I was at 27. She's just as much a sexual being as she was at 27 and uh, more so, in fact. Uh, and we could not, as pastors, enjoy and operate within a liberty of dignity, equality, mutuality, servanthood, love, uh, exclusivity. And then hide that while we knew people in the congregation uh, that the devil was shaming them for this is happening to you because or you wanted this or you asked for this or you know you two were doing this. And we would not empower him or partner with him in the next session. So we just said, well, here's where it is. Here's what's really going on. Here's what we believe to be true. And people say, well, you're, you shouldn't be so open. But we realize that if we're not open, that the devil comes and whispers and condemns and shames. And people walk through life with negative expectation and they lose their job or the tire goes out. Mm -hmm. or the baby gets the sniffles and they say, it's because of what y'all were doing last night. And we just, there's just, God cannot be that small. God cannot be that small to invent all this and to put us in a place where in marriage it is full dignity, full equality, that what's mine is hers and hers is mine, just like Paul said. Uh, and then and then be wanting to shame and condemn for what goes on. And so uh, Great Married right. Sex was born out of that. Uh, the Proper Way to the Peach, our first book, was born out of that. We actually have another one coming out. We'll be married 20 years in August. Our next one comes out, The Virgin and the Trollop. 
Uh, we've got one coming out on why adultery sucks, et cetera. But um, uh, we talk about it just not only from our experience, but from 20 years of counseling other couples and the things that they deal with. So um, it's important and you can't, it's hard to find in the church, you know, or you it find is, some, man. you find some weird twisted, well, now men are sexual beings and they have a need and women should accommodate that need. And women, if you'll jump in, you'll enjoy yeah. it too. And maybe if you, and all that just backwards <laughs> stuff we do. Uh, and uh, we just feel like, no, it's, it's deeper and it's, um, um, People need freedom, and they need deliverance, and they need enjoyment, uh, and the recreation, uh, and the gift—the gift of married sex—and they oh, need to pass yeah. it on, pass it on generationally, so their kids don't grow up with that same dysfunction. Yeah, yeah, and talk about it more. You know, I think it's one of those things that are taboo, uh, especially among uh, church. You know, um, pastors—they sure. don't—they don't talk about that, man. I mean, I'm seeing more liberty in the church now, talking a little bit more about it. But not as open. I've never found anybody to talk about it like you and Pastor Connie and how you uh, fully discuss it. Um, we're, we're running up on this hour time match. I promised myself I was not going to go over this hour. <laughs> I promised myself. Um, I, I want people to hear what you got going on, and because you've got something, nothing else matters that you teach on Sunday. Yeah, and you've got um, things on on YouTube, and I want the listeners, all those who are listening, to to kind of follow follow you and listen and hear some of the things that you got going on. Also, the, we didn't get talking about the land party. I know that's something that you know you and I discussed. Uh, yeah, the political party that because you got some. Um, listen, I don't believe in all this other stuff on this right side, but then I don't believe all this stuff on the left side, but. What you know? What do I find myself as a Christian man? If you want to close out and talk about so many things you got coming up, uh, so we can you know help with what you do. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, uh, thank you. It's very kind. So uh, the book uh, "Virgin: The Virgin and the Trollop" comes out in August. You can find it at michaelandconnie.com. We're going to start taking pre-orders probably a month from now, towards the end of July. Uh, Nothing else matters is our weekly global Sunday gathering where we just get together and talk about how the living Christ transforms our understanding of church, understanding of religion. Uh, And um, we see God, see us, see our fellow human beings differently, different eschatology that, that surely being a Christian is not about, you know, being on the right team before you die and all those uh, things within the absence of true revelation of Christ, we had to make up and fill in the blanks, you know, well then what is this about? If it's not about, you know, if it's not about, you know, the, the angry God is going to come get us one day, then what's really going on here? So we deal with that on uh, Nothing Else Matters. And you can find us on YouTube. It's uh, our channel is official Michael and Connie Smith, official Michael and Connie Smith. But you can get the same link at michaelandconnie.com. But that idea of nothing else matters and, and transforming our concept of religion in the light of the person of Christ transitions now to the political. The Lamb Party is, uh, you know, if Christ were designed, if it's a it's a political party based on the Christ-centered worldview that uh, that would affirm dignity for all, equality for all, uh, uh, provision, justice, uh, 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 you know, um, protection, blah blah blah, uh, for for all human beings. That if Christ were to institute a system of government, it would look very much like the prophecies given of heaven and earth reuniting. Uh, and what is that? And so we kind of split God in half uh, in our current political climate. You know, one part. The left claims we got God, and the right claims they got God. And in this having of God, we weaponize those different parts of his personality. And so the Lamb Party, and something we've been working on for a long time, and working with candidates, and and uh, and I know you and I have talked about this, but really formulating that for 2022 to say, look, if you want to know uh, the, the, the mind of Christ concerning these matters, uh, just a place for Christians to go, you know, I feel like I, I'm putting a voting booth to pick who's God and who's the devil, and honestly, I see God in both and the devil in the both, and we got to stop weaponizing that and say neither is God, neither is the devil, um, but here is the heart of Christ. And and um, honestly, we just got to let stop letting Christ be weaponized. That you know, in order to take Christ to some group, we must have first taken him from because right, he's the God of the whole world. Everybody was made in a image and likeness. Paul says everybody knows them in his heart. And we're somebody say, well, how can Christ be at everybody? Well, maybe he's not living, but he's entombed, waiting to be resurrected inside them for them to walk as image bearing humanity that he has created them to walk in. And so that land party is based on that universal dignity of all people. And uh, so that's. That's just stuff we got going on, and, and God is good, and I thank you for just uh, inviting me, uh, conversations at the wall, let me be part of it, and um, I just appreciate the love, and, and your, very, your kindness, you and Karen, just thank you just for love all the way around. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Pastor Michael T. Smith. I call you, I put that V, that, that makes it more, more important, doesn't it? But sure, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's official, yeah. <laughs> 
Pastor Michael T. Smith, man, I, I so love you so, so very much for what you guys have imparted to my life. Um, not just publicly over the pulpit thing, but even personally, you know, we've had opportunity to come down and be a part of the small gatherings you've had. And man, I've been so yeah. grateful, man. So uh, you guys follow him, find, find him on Instagram, find him, you know, uh, Connie Loves Mike is the Instagram. Uh, you can find him, uh, Michael Tyler Smith, but you probably got too many follow, you know, people now. So, um, but the YouTube, nothing else matters. Yeah. Please go by and check it out. Uh, if they want to give, give you something, can they give you something? Uh, uh yeah yeah totally yeah no yeah i didn't say this i didn't talk to them about this i just thought about it man if you got something tonight man you want to sell to them hey yeah uh just you can, honestly that's very kind uh we have a lot going on and a lot of the things we preach uh are not welcome everywhere. So I'll just say that. So all the support <laughs> means a lot. So uh, michaelandconnie.com, if you want to go there, uh, we have a support tab. You say, hey, I want to be behind what you're doing. Uh, every little bit helps us formulate and kind of unveil Christ, recover Christ, uh, so that maybe we won't pass on the generational dysfunction we've had in the church, the political dysfunction we've carried on, uh, and trying to contend for a new life, new creation, um, really affirming the dignity of all people. So you're very kind. So yeah, michaelandconnie.com forward slash support. Uh, you can find it all there. So thank you again. Okay, family. So I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Mike, for being here with me, man. I so appreciate this time. And for those of you who are watching, come on, man, jsmonline.com. Go by the website. Check out some of the things that we got going on. Also, I got the new podcast, man. John Stevenson uh, for the Vision for Change. You can go ahead and check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all the wonderful things. And I'm 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 everywhere. I'm trying. I'm trying to be like you, Pastor Mike. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> you know, brother, we, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it together. We're gonna do it together. We're, I'll play my little triangle in the band, ding, and you do your part, and we'll uh, advance heaven's cause here in our generation. Amen. Listen, we love you guys so much. And I do want to remind you all things are possible if you can just believe. So check us out. We'll be back with more guests and more folks be on here. Talk to you and love on you. All right. You guys have a good night.